For the New York Institute for the Humanities at NYU, I'm Eric Banks. Vivian Gornick is the author of several books, including the celebrated memoir, Fierce Attachments, The Odd Woman in the City, a finalist for the NBCC Award in Autobiography, and the essay collections, The End of the Novel of Love and The Men in My Life, both of which were nominated for the National Book Critics Circle Award for Criticism. She has been a fellow of the NYIH for many years. Her new book is titled Unfinished Business, Notes of a Chronic Rereader, which is being published by FSG. All right, thank you for coming, and congratulations on the new book. Oh, thanks a lot. It's wonderful. (laughs) You begin the book by writing, uh, It has often been my experience that rereading a book that was important to me at earlier times in my life is something like lying on the analyst's couch. The narrative I've had by heart for years is suddenly being called into alarming question. (laughs) Yeah. I'm wondering what motivated you to take on this particular concern, what it means to reread, and what rereading has meant to you personally at this point in your career. Is this a question that has occupied you for some time? No, actually. The experience, of course, has occupied me for some time. But no, actually, I came to write this book because of a clever editor, uh, my editor (laughs) at FSG, Eileen Smith. I happened to reread E.M. Forster's Howard's End. I can't remember when it was again, a couple of years ago now. Mm-hmm. A friend of mine asked me to reread it with her. I hadn't read it since college, and I reread the book and was shocked at how different it looked to me. So I wrote that up in a small piece uh, that the Time, the New York Times published, and then Eileen said, this is a book. <laughs> Sit down and write it. I hadn't really thought of it, but once I once she suggested that, it took hold, and um, and I became hooked on the, on the idea of rereading and seeing where it took me. Yeah. What was your reaction to the Forster? That's not one of the uh, figures in the book. I don't believe he comes up. No, no, he doesn't actually. That beginning, though, comes from that piece. Uh-huh. It's often been my experience that rereading, um, and it, it's really true. I remember everything wrong. It was set in 1890. I thought it was 1920. What? It's in Rome. I thought it was New York. It was that kind of thing. A lot a lot of that. And yet, uh, you find that the book still holds you. Yeah. And then you have to ask yourself why. Yeah, it's and, weird the things that, 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 that stick with you. I remember yeah. the Schlegel sisters so clearly. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And I yes, remember the Lost yeah. Umbrella very Right. episode very clearly. There's a lot that I don't remember so clearly about that. There were a book. lot of details I got wrong. But but the thing that shocked me the most was, um, as I said in that original piece, when I was young and I read it, it seemed very mysterious to me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and I, I, I got into the drama and the poetry and the melancholy of the mystery, as young people do. Now I read it, and it did not seem mysterious to me. I thought I knew what it was all about and what he was all about. And it touched me just as much. Mm-hmm. So I had to describe that differently. And that's what the piece was about. Yeah. Uh, was there one thing that most surprised you uh, in the different encounters you had with your previous <clears throat> reading self in the book, that you, in the process of writing it, that most shocked you, I guess, that you were most surprised to find oh, out about yourself? Oh, in the book? Well, the, the Lawrence part, the Sons and Lovers, which I once read uh, aloud at the Institute, mm-hmm. that was the book that delivered the big and Colette actually I guess Colette administered the most dramatic change of heart in me and as I said I could not when I was 23 years old she was the world to us and she was like Tolstoy Mm -hmm. she we thought everything she, she had made of a woman in love the equal of God and man or war and peace and now you read it and you think, what young woman today <clears throat> could read her as I read her? Nobody. Yeah. The question answers itself. And when I was young and read her, she made of that question of uh, the great passion, you know, sexual passion uh, in a woman's life. She made of it a great drama. She made it mythic. She made it poetic. She made it have immense weight. Well, you know, it doesn't. (laughs) (laughs) So so we've all lived long enough uh, now. And the thing that's really shocking is no no young woman would subscribe to that today, Yeah, (laughs) no matter what they feel. When you, um, taking taking Colette as an example, when you you plunged back into these books that had meant so much to you at different periods in your life. Yeah. Did you go in expecting to be disappointed by a Colette? Did you, was it, was it really a, like a somewhat shocking experience? Absolutely, always. Every one of these were books that I loved, treasured, that uh, nourished me for 
long, long periods of time, and I expected to experience the same thing. I reread them in order to feel as nourished as I did before until it became interesting that they, I was reading them differently. And then yeah. were you able to sort of slog your way through if that were the case? Yeah. Well, you didn't just give once, up and well, throw it across Well, once I had another frame of reference, once it became interesting to me, examples of something I was devoted to, then it was, it was sort of exciting. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, I, didn't, I didn't get depressed. I got excited when, when I saw the difference between then and now. When you were organizing the book, when you were first beginning, did you have a set of, did, did, had you already sort of isolated a set of people you wanted to look at no. and books that you wanted to go into? No, that was actually a good part. I did these these books intuitively. When I came to the end of one, I let a, some kind of a transition develop in my head about what would be good next. And that's how I, I operated. So that, for instance, after Lawrence, it was very natural to go to Colette. And from Colette, to Marguerite de Ross was no problem, no, no stretch at all. Then I was finished with that. And then the next most subtle version of these, this question of love and feelings and, was Elizabeth Bowen. And it just went like that. Mm-hmm. I, you know. There were certain, there were moments when I simply knew I wanted to include something. And then I found a way to fit it in, like the Delmore Schwartz yeah, and A. B. Yeshua part. Yeah, I, which is incredible. I think that was oh, the, the, the that that was especially interesting because I think you don't you don't expect to come out of that chapter the way that the way that you do. There's an appreciation yeah. that's really like hard won. Thank you. And very deserve. I and really feels... worked hard on that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think it's also really impressive that you that there's a there's a nice mix of. Authors who are in translation and authors whose, for, whose language is English. Yeah. It's a very Catholic set of tastes, I think. Oh, but a, but a, although one of the things I was going to ask you about, the books that, that you come back to look at again, and I think there's, there are a lot of reasons for this, they do tend to be books that have a, a real emotional heft. There's very little comedy. Uh, and there's very... <laughs> I don't really see it. I mean, except for maybe right. particularly cats, which I don't yeah. think sounds like a very humorous book no, either. No, no. <laughs> so. No, no. I'm an earnest girl. <laughs> I always have been. I've been accused of having no sense of play or fun all my life. <laughs> well, that's not true. I, well, it's, I, I mean, I, when I've gone back and reread book, books of comedy that were important to me, yeah. I, I find it a horrifying experience. Oh, really? Yeah. Why? I, I mean, it doesn't even really matter if it's high comedy or if it's... It's a particular kind of literary comedy, but they just don't hold up. They don't hold up. Diary of a Nobody is about the only one I know that always delivers. I don't know this. that book. Who, um, oh, that uh, George Wall. Grossman. Oh, George Grossman. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it, and it really does work. Yeah, and I know a couple of other people have yeah. had that experience with yeah. it. Um, but other things, and it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter if it's Confederacy of Dunces or, uh-huh. or if it's John right. Waters' collected essays. It's like there's something yeah. funny about the way that comedy doesn't quite. It's very Work temporal. The same way. It's, it's comedy like movies are incredibly of their moment. I've been wanting for years to reread Out of Sheer Rage, but I've been afraid to. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> a book I loved deeply, as many people have. But I'll give it a shot. <laughs> I, I did reread that, and it does. It does oh, is still it? work. Make yeah. you laugh. Yeah, it does still work. Yeah. Partly, I think, because of the talk you gave at the Institute a few years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, when I read the unfinished part of the title, uh, you know, as a reminder of how much reading a book is not a singular experience, and it is a singular experience, but it but there is this relay over time. So you experience it multiple times. But it's put me in mind of an essay you cited it when you gave your talk, Calvino's essay, Why Read the Classics. Mm-hmm. And I kept thinking about a couple of things that he had to say in relation to the book. One of his quotes, which I think you may have used, was a classic as a book that is never yeah. finished saying what it has to yeah. say. Yeah. I actually wanted to call my book that. They wouldn't let me. They wouldn't let you? No. Why not? I don't know. Too long. or I don't know what, but I really, I thought that was the right title. It, yeah, it might be funny on Amazon. I don't know. <laughs> Although whenever you Googled Calvino, that would pop up. This is yes, like a point. certainly. It's a great sentence. But then he also says, every rereading of a classic is as much a voyage of discovery as the first reading. And I was kind of curious how you would react to that. Yeah. How much of that holds true for you in the experience of writing this oh, book? Oh, yeah. I hope my book demonstrates that. Nothing could be uh, truer. I'm now starting to write an essay on a book that, uh, or a set of books that I read many years ago and suddenly got hooked on all over again. And that's the two-volume bi- autobiography of Storm Jameson. Hmm. 
English writer who was very well known in the first part of the 20th century and long fallen into this, this something or other. Storm Jameson wrote 45 novels, mm. most of them mediocre. And when she was 70 years old, she sat down and started to write this autobiography, this mem- memoir. It's a two-volume memoir. And it's a masterpiece. It's a marvelous book. I mean, she does in this everything that she couldn't do in the, the novels. And I wanted to write about how the meaning of every writer having only one genre that they can excel in. And she lived long enough to discover that she could do this, but well, she didn't discover it, but the readers have discovered it. It was the same with Edmund Goss. He wrote poetry, Victorian poetry, which is nothing, and then Father and Son, which is a masterpiece. Yeah. So I'm reading this book for the third time, this journey from the North. And again, I pick up things that I didn't remember at all. It isn't that what I did, what I do remember of what I read before is not true, but it feels so much thicker now. There are so many things I look at now in that book that I just never registered or I forgot. I forgot the, the tone, the texture, the feel of it, how, how that feel got developed in the book. And I can see it now. So that's thrilling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it is thrilling. It's it a, is. But it, it's thrilling. Do you find it disconcerting at all? I mean, do you find no. this kind of vertiginous relationship with your the way that you read it previously? Or is it just a pleasant surprise? No, it's great. It's more than that. It's nourishing. Yeah. 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 I feel as if I'm... Earning my life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> one other thing that, that uh, I'm just going to ask you to react to one one more Calvino uh, line: to read a great book for the first time in one's maturity is an extraordinary pleasure, different from the one cannot say greater or lesser than the pleasure of having read it in one's youth. Yeah. And he says in a related way: whether we use the verb read or the verb uh, reread, reread is of little importance. Yes, yes, yeah. He's great that way. Yeah. You know, a great example of uh, that experience was was described by Edmund Wilson, who never read Uncle Tom's Cabin until he was quite mature and was so shocked. I had the same experience. I never read Uncle Tom's Ta- Cabin till a few years ago when I wrote a review for the Los Angeles Times book review. Uh, it was the know, 150th uh, anniversary, of t- and I read it for the first time. I was so shocked at how, what a great bo- how great a book it is. And we all thought we knew what Uncle Tom's Cabin is. I'm sure I made many references to it over the years without knowing what I was talking about. And he did, too. Well, it was an extraordinary experience in, in grown-up life to mm-hmm. read that book, which had been such a, um, a punchline <laughs> yeah, yeah. throughout my life. And he wrote wonderfully about it, Patriotic Gore. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, Calvino has a line, too, somewhere about one's library should be composed half of books you've read and half of books you oh, did he say you, that? you will read. God, he said everything <laughs> worth saying. <laughs> it's a really a terrific. Yeah, uh, he's wonderful. Kind of an amazing, amazing essay. He's a wonderful writer. I'm wondering how you would relate this book to um, the collection, your earlier collections, to uh, The End of the Novel of Love and to The Men in My Life. Oh, well, I guess it's the same voice, sort of. It's the same person writing. Um, they do all feel that they belong on a line. I think in in each case, a set of books are collected in order to look at reading from a certain perspective. And then another collection, like The Men in My Life, uh, represented for me a place that I got to finally where I felt immense sympathy for the depression that dogged the lives of all of these men. And I suddenly saw how noble it was that they kept on writing. And it was from that perspective that I wrote it. So that's a particular perspective Mm -hmm. from which I wrote. And then the end of the novel of love speaks for itself. I didn't realize myself how much I'd written about that kind of thing until, again, I'm a, I'm a writer who really needs an editor. <laughs> Another, an, a great editor, Deb Chasman, who runs the Boston Review, she was then uh, an editor at Beacon Press. She put that book together, and she said to me, write an essay to that, that line, and mm-hmm. that's a book. And she was right. You know, In other words, reading is the constant the way of seeing things, the things that grab your interest in a deep way, they determine the shape of each of these books. For me, they're all of a piece. I mean, I recognize myself in the writing of all of these books. Mm-hmm. I don't know how else to put it. Yeah. Do you go back and reread your, your Never. books? 
So you're not so you're not really a chronic rereader. <laughs> oh, I I'm am joking. of everybody else. <laughs> no, never. I've never Googled Googled myself and I've never reread myself. <laughs> Receptivity is a major theme in the book, um, and it yes. especially comes out yes. in your account of, of Jail Carr and yeah. Pat Barker and, yeah. um, oh, and the, the Doris Lessing, I think, as well. Yeah, yeah right, In a kind right. of very funny yeah. way. Yeah, receptivity is everything, and uh, I it's don't It's such think a mystery, too. It is. It's astonishing. I don't, I think I put this in, in the Jail Carr part and regeneration. I'm, I must have. It was Doris Grumbach, the, an, a, a critic who's, I guess, long dead now. She once wrote a piece I never forgot in which she reread a book she read some years before, and she wrote in order to chastise herself for having trashed this book five years ago. Now she picked it up, and she said, God, it's wonderful. How could I ever have done that? Mm -hmm. And she didn't go on you know, beating herself. She, she just said, I guess I wasn't ready for it, which is the best way to look at it. But... Of course, that's what makes and breaks careers, lives, right? Yeah. The mood of the, the reviewer <laughs> mm -hmm. at a given moment. She could have written that review very differently, and that writer might have had a different career. <laughs> Who knows? It's true. And there's also, I mean, there's all, the mystery of it, too. It's almost like the book finds you rather than the other way around. I should think so. It's sitting I there waiting for that. you. I really think that. You read the books you need to when you need to. I, th I thought the jail car was especially just... It's very moving, and and oh, you, I, I love you. You wrote at the end of the chapter where you discuss Carr and Pat Barker's book uh, Regeneration. Sometimes I shiver when I think that I might not have reread either A Month in the Country or Regeneration, and then I shiver some more thinking of all the good books I wasn't in the mood to take in the first time I read them and never went back to. I don't mind if I've read only once a book that has left me prizing mediocrity. I can live with that. But the other way around, that feels oppressive. <laughs> that is such great. <laughs> true. Isn't that true? It really is. Yeah. 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 No, I think Carr, that book really oh. deserves a readership. Yeah. Oh, God, it really does. It's one of those books, too, that I, how you remember what you remember about a book. I remember so, very specific things about it. And then I wonder if it, there was a, a movie made out of it, I believe. It was lousy. Yeah, it was horrible. But I, I somehow can I picture the English sunshine from that film yes. in some kind of weird yeah. way and yeah. remember that. But yeah. now I have to go back and reread that yeah. book as it's well. Yeah, it's a shame. That movie did absolutely not capture the atmosphere of that book at all. But you're right. You can feel the weather. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say in the writing of this book, did you encounter or reread a book that you utterly lost faith in, not even of the Colette type, but, but even more severe, where no. it was just like, no. If it came to that, I wouldn't have included it because, as W.H. Auden taught me a long time ago, it's pointless to write about bad art. There's no point to it except to establish your own smarts. I wouldn't do that. So when, when I did reread a book and felt nothing, I just let it go. Mm -hmm. And I, the discussion also of Jude the Obscure is a really interesting one because it's the mm -hmm. one book where you say, I think it's finally stopped talking to me. Right. I just recently, a set of notes fell out of a book I took off my shelf that was about Sue Brighthead. These notes were about her. And I was shocked to see how long period of time it has been that she's been on my mind. And I saw it very differently than I do now. I mean, at that point, when I was writing those notes, there was nothing about her that irritated me. <laughs> <laughs> Now, she did irritate me. But on the other hand, I all, the irritation was profitable. It made me see her in a light that was not dismissive. Well, so. there's, a, there's a little um, story that you tell in, when you're discussing her where I think you're teaching an adult class and some... Yeah, some smart uh, You call it a smart ass. Yeah. Said, Why didn't she just get a job? Why did she get a job? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Is any of the irritation with this book or, or irritation with books, how much do you account for that being social rather than somehow deep inside you? The time in which in which it's being reread re yeah. now, and do I give any credit to the responses of people I often want to dismiss, thinking they're ignorant or smartass or this? No, I've taught myself to try to slow down and listen and try to understand why. You know, it's all those years of teaching uh, that make you sort of struggle to try to understand why a student is saying this, and if you hear it more than once. 
then you know there's something in the air for them. And I think I should try to, but I'm very intolerant. You know, I can't, I really, that's why I hate teaching. <laughs> in this case and in other cases like it, I struggle to understand, is it the reader or is it the book that is bringing forth this moronic response? <laughs> <laughs> No, definitely. It's it, the times change. I change. The times change. The books change. The re- so yeah. I try to understand. I mean, not understand, but I try to include all that. Are you? Do you still teach? No. I hope never again. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask you about how much when you're sort of working on this material. Have, have you been a long time keeper of journals about books? Have you kept a reading journal for years? Or were you using that as a resource or? No. I mean, you sound like you're also like your books are very well marked up, I would imagine. I yeah. get that impression, especially from the last chapter in the book. Yeah. But yeah. you've never been someone who... No, no. But the books are on the shelf for yeah. years at a time. Uh, and every now and then I weed them out because I don't want to live, you know, drowning in books. Mm-hmm. And then I'm sometimes sorry I got rid of this one or that one, but mostly not, mostly not. So the books on the shelf are books that I emotionally need to see on the shelf mm-hmm. and and or books that I consult from time to time that I know I'm going to look at again. And it's from those books that this collection came. Yeah. Every one of them has been on the shelf for years. Before we go, I wanted to ask you about another book you have coming out, a reprint of The Romance of American Communism. Yes. That's amazing. <laughs> Couldn't agree more. <laughs> Can you say something about how that came to be? And uh, Nobody's going to like hearing this. I really got talked into it. A wonderful editor at Verso, Jessie Kindig, she came to me and wanted very badly to republish this book. And I thought, no, why, why would anyone want to republish this book? And it's, it's the book whose writing I most deplore of all the books mm. I've ever, of everything I've ever written. I've always felt it was rhetorical and over the top and emotional when it should have been analytic and all, you know, all kinds of complaints I have about my own writing in this uh, particular case. But I reread this book because Mm -hmm. I was really asked to. And I do have to say the stories that the old communists tell are still very moving. So whenever I let them talk, speak for themselves, and most of the book, they are speaking for themselves, I, I sort of agreed that it was worth, perhaps it's worth seeing the light of day again. And then I've discovered since then that there are many, many young people who know of this book and are devoted to it. And that sort of shocked me. And I thought, there is something going on in the world that I'm not aware of. And they have multiplied, you know, since since this project began. So we'll let the chips fall where they may. Yes, yeah. it's being pub- republished in... Um, April, I think it is. Okay. And, um, you know, w- one of the worst experiences of my life were the reviews of this book. <laughs> they oh, were, right. oh, it was a nightmare. <laughs> they really sent me to bed for a week. It, they when were you were, all... Was it 1977? 70, yeah. Okay. A- everyone was a treasuring review. Every single one, you know, no matter who was writing and from what perspective. I was very naive. I didn't realize... That in 1978, the issue was still as alive for many people as it had been in 19, you know, 38, 48, 58. I was really naive about that. I did, just didn't realize it at all. Mm-hmm. It was the end of my apprenticeship in a certain way. After that book, I, I felt that the book received bad reviews because of the writing. I thought the writing just did not make terms. It it was the end of my apprenticeship in that sense. I mm-hmm. looked hard at it, and I saw that that was true, and uh, and I determined never again. And uh, so, <laughs> it has a it has a remarkable cult following. I, it's I, unbelievable. Yeah, I I, I don't know who they are. I see it come up like every single day on someone's Twitter feed. That's You're exaggeration, kidding. but it comes up quite a bit. I saw someone. What? Who? Trying to finagle a free copy out of someone, a PDF, uh, oh in a Twitter feed by a very it's respected historian. I was surprised that he couldn't go on AB Books and find I, a copy. I don't understand it. I think it has just sprung up since yeah. Trump got elected. I think it is fairly recent. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. I don't ever remember this, and I haven't heard any of it. I'm not on social media at all, so I don't know from anything that goes on there. But yeah, that's what Jesse told me, yeah. and Adam Schatz told me, and other people. And 
So, you know, I'm like the deceived wife, the last to know. (laughs) (laughs) Well, on that note, thank you so much and congratulations on the book. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good. This podcast was brought to you by the New York Institute for the Humanities at NYU and the Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute. This episode was produced by Caitlin Nicholas. You can find us on Stitcher, iTunes, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. For more information, visit us at www.nyihumanities.org.